Hello and welcome to a webinar on preconception family risk assessment. I am Sarah Ramaya, curriculum designer at ASRM. Please join me in welcoming my colleagues Jessica Goldstein and today's moderator, Ms. Lauren Isley. Before we begin, please note this webinar was developed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other reproductive professionals. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always remember to use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or clinical practice limitations. All attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type a question in the question chat window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notification. Let me introduce our moderator, Ms. Isley, is a clinical science liaison at Generate Life Sciences. She received her master's degree in genetic counseling from Wayne State University and is the current chair-elect of the genetic counseling professional group at ASRM. I will now turn the presentation over to Ms. Isley to introduce today's speakers and moderate the session. Thank you, Sarah. Today, I am pleased to introduce both of our speakers, Ms. Amy Vance and Ms. Andrea Besser. Amy Vance is a licensed board certified genetic counselor who has been in practice for 30 years. Amy founded Bay Area Genetic Counseling in 2001, a boutique private practice focusing primarily on serving couples and egg donors pre IVF, but also offers cancer risk assessment and genetic counseling for other genetic indications. Amy's passion has been continuing to educate providers about the value of genetic counseling in the ART practice, focusing specific attention to the family history. Amy has offered several articles and abstracts and delivered dozens of invited presentations on the topic of the importance of family history for egg donors and couples preconceptionally. Ms. Andrea Besser is a board-certified genetic counselor and is currently the Director of Reproductive Genetics at the NYU Langone Fertility Center. Andrea received her MS in genetic counseling at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and has specialized in reproductive genetics, ART, and particularly pre-implantation genetic testing for the past decade. She is an active member of ASRM's Genetic Counseling Professional Group and Patient Education Committee. Disclosures, Amy and Andrea have no disclosures to share. Uh, I am a full-time employee at Generate Life Sciences. Today's learning outcomes, we're going to use case presentations to illustrate the importance of genetic counseling for all patients as a routine pre-IVF screening. Learn how a three-generation pedigree as a screening tool for each patient can provide insight into specific risks and screening for your patients. Relate case presentations to published professional guidelines. And then we'll end today with a discussion and Q&A session. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, the family history. So the premise of this talk is that all preconception patients, especially those using IVF, can benefit from a family history risk assessment by a genetic counselor. Many of you are familiar with the role of genetic counselors at carrier screening or PGT labs, but a lab-based genetic counselor's main role is really to assist providers and patients in understanding their genetic test results. And while some basic family history may be taken, it's not a substitute for a thorough and complete family history risk assessment. The family risk assessment can really be thought of as a screening test. And while genetic carrier screening might be more of a routine screening practice in your office, carrier screening identifies hidden traits that don't usually show up in the family history. And the family history 
can identify important genetic risks that are not detectable by carrier screening. They're both important, but they're not the same. So what is the family history risk assessment? It's basically a three-generation pedigree taken by a genetic counselor. And genetic counselors are trained to not only collect, but also analyze detailed family history information for genetic disorders. We are well-versed in features of genetic conditions and patterns in families, and this allows us to ask targeted questions during our family history collection and pursue certain leads to collect more accurate detail. And ideally, this type of risk assessment would be provided to anyone preconceptionally and especially anyone who's uh, choosing to undergo IVF. A lot of clinics require this type of risk assessment for gamete donors, but fewer clinics require it for all couples. So questionnaires can collect family history, but certain red flags are more likely to be identified by a genetic counselor, and we're going to use case reports to show that detail. It also allows targeted screening to be offered, which is unique kinds of testing that's not part of a typical carrier screening panel. And you don't want to miss these since potentially PGTM might be able to be offered to your patient. It could be a liability issue if this type of testing was missed. Okay, so in our first case, this couple was referred by the IVF clinic um, due to the female patient's concern about a family history of cancer. Her maternal aunt had breast cancer at age 63 years. The patient uh, stated that she wanted any and all testing that was available for cancer. And the family was extremely worried about this history, so much so that the patient's mother also joined the couple on the call. So the family history taken from the patient is she is the 40-year-old woman uh, with the arrow in the diagram. And uh, her maternal aunt, which is shown uh, with the marks on the right-hand side, had unilateral breast cancer at age 63. Interestingly uh, enough, there was no other family history of cancer on the female patient side, but there was a genetic disease. Um, there's this condition that's marked catacil. This is an autosomal dominant arteriopathy associated with stroke. And the patient's maternal aunt that had cancer also had catacil, and the grandfather on the mother's side died at 79 of a stroke and also had this condition. The grandfather and the aunt had a mutation identified in the NOTCH3 gene, and reportedly my patient's mother tested negative. However, it would be very important to, I mean, I rigorously took this family history looking for cancer, but also looking for other types of genetic conditions. And this is a single gene condition inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion that you would not want to miss because if the patient's mother hadn't been worked up, this would be very important. So the patient herself has a very low risk for cancer, but since she was interested in, quote, any and all testing. We did discuss uh, what testing would look like, and Andrea is going to get into a lot more details about uh, cancer genetic testing and the pros and cons and pitfalls of that. But there is a, there's a higher risk if we did a testing panel on the female patient of finding something like a variant of uncertain significance, which is not ideal, uh, than there is of actually identifying a true mutation. And so after genetic counseling, the patient declined testing. However, as part of routine practice, uh, I never let the patient off the hook without taking a full family history. And so in talking to the male partner, you can see that he has a very significant family of breast cancer, which looks like there could be a hereditary predisposition situation happening on his side. So this is a very dramatic example, but it is a real example. And you can see that his mother had breast cancer at age 40. She had cancer in the other breast at age 57. Her sister had breast cancer at 45. Next sister had breast cancer and was currently dealing with brain meths at age 64. Then the next sister had breast cancer at 56. The male patient's 
maternal grandfather died in an accident at age 36. So his history is somewhat limited, but his brother had brain cancer and died in his 50s. His daughter had breast cancer at 63. His sister had breast cancer in her 40s. Both of her daughters had breast cancer in their 40s. And the great grandmother had, quote, lung cancer, but it wasn't clear. Potentially could have been breast cancer that was a metastasis to the lung. And then on the grandmother's side, she had sinus cancer, but was a smoker. And she had um, an aunt who also had breast cancer. So obviously there's a lot of cancer. Some of the hallmarks in this family are that there's multiple generations, young ages, bilateral cancer, cancer that's similar. And so it doesn't take a geneticist to see that this is looks like a high risk family. And so if there were an autosomal dominant cancer predisposition gene in this family, then the male patient's risk to have inherited it if his mother in fact had that would be 50% and the risk to his offspring would be 25%. So the couple came to me originally interested in workup for cancer for the purposes of PGTM. And so in talking about this family history with the couple, really the best person to offer testing to is the male partner's mother since she's the closest affected relative. She had had testing in 2015, which was negative. There was a panel of tests that she had, but there are a few more genes on the newer panels and there's a little bit better technology available in terms of looking for deletions and duplications in those genes. And so in order to obtain a new panel, we talked about the male partner's mother either reaching out to her original genetic counselor or she could have a consultation with me. And the patient ended up scheduling an appointment with me and we reviewed her family history and uh, the ability to perform some additional testing. She was very nervous about the testing. I think that this is not an uncommon feeling that patients have, even though it might seem slightly uh, non-intuitive since she had been tested before and she had already had cancer, but she was nervous. I think it brings up a lot of the anxieties that she went through in her original testing procedure, but a positive test result uh, would be able to give her information potentially on the cause of cancer in herself and her family members. It could potentially influence medical management if she was tested positive for a gene that was associated with other cancers. It would allow her son and daughter a clear path for testing. Her daughter was considering prophylactic mastectomy. So if this patient, the patient's mother tested positive, it would allow her to avoid surgery if she had a true negative test result. And so choosing which panel we chose, I gave her an option. There's a shorter panel and a longer panel. The shorter panel involved 14 genes associated only with breast cancer. The longer panel involved 47 genes that were associated with other GYN cancers, but the longer panel has a higher variant of uncertain significance rate of 38%, which Andrea is going to talk about a little bit more. And the people, the number of uh, patients that would screen positive in that panel is 12%. So due to her being kind of nervous about testing, she chose the shorter panel. She didn't want to take such a high chance of getting a VUS because she felt that this type of information would make her very nervous and it's not actionable. And so we ordered the testing. Her test results were negative. And so the possible explanations include that either there was a mutation in another gene that's causing the cancer in the family, or potentially the family history is not related to a single gene, or that the mutation is undetectable by current technology. And so since her testing was negative, there's no additional testing to offer um, her family members, and PGTM is not an option. So in general, cancer is multifactorial, meaning that it can't be attributed to just a single cause. It's usually due to interaction of both genetic and environmental factors. There's only a small percentage of cancers that can be attributed to a monogenic or a Mendelian cause. For example, with breast cancer, about 5 to 10% of cases are due to heritable mutations in individual genes. 
while another 15 to 20 percent or so is considered familial, meaning that it seems to be running in the family, but it's more likely due to multiple shared genetic risk factors, um, not just a single gene and also shared environmental factors. And then the remaining 70 to 80 percent or so of breast cancer occurs sporadically. Hereditary cancer syndromes also usually show reduced penetrance, uh, meaning that not everyone who inherits a mutation will necessarily develop cancer. Um, some people are going to go through their entire lifetime, even if they have a, a mutation, um, not developing any symptoms. So in order to assess risk for hereditary cancers, NCCN guidelines recommend doing a detailed family history of first, second, and third degree relatives, so siblings, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and paying particular attention to the type of cancer diagnosed, including the pathology, age of diagnosis, bilaterality. So for example, um, if a patient has had breast cancer twice, it's really important to distinguish between a recurrence in the same breast versus a new primary in the other breast. Any risk-reducing surgeries, for example, if someone in the family had a hysterectomy at a young age due to fibroids, that person isn't really gonna be helpful in assessing familial risk for uh, uterine cancer. Ethnicity, carcinogen exposure to potentially rule out an environmental cause, prior genetic testing, um, and other certain cancer syndrome features. So, for example, we see macrocephaly commonly in Cowden syndrome. Um, we can see freckles on the lips in poit jagger syndrome or pneumothorax in Berthog-Dubé. And there are certain red flags that are going to be more likely to indicate a hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, so, multiple relatives with the same or related cancers, such as a pattern of breast, ovarian, and pancreatic, or a pattern of ovarian, colon, and uterine. Um, younger age is diagnosis than expected, so that's going to be very specific to the particular cancer. So, for example, with breast um, and colon cancer, under age 50 would be a red flag, but testicular cancer under 50 wouldn't be since that's when most cases occur. We talked about bilateral cancers, rare cancers like ovarian, uh, neuroendocrine, pancreatic, or Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, since there are certain founder variants that are more common. So one issue that came up during this case, sorry, even though it was the female partner who was referred for cancer genetics, um, it was the male partner that had the strong family history, yet it was a female partner that was referred. And, and this is not so unusual because usually men are less likely to be asked questions about their family history of cancer. They're, they're less likely to be offered cancer genetic counseling or testing. But it's, it is important to realize that these conditions are usually inherited in an autosomal dominant way. Um, so men are just as likely to inherit these conditions and pass them on to, to their children. Another issue to be aware of when assessing the family history is that if there are lots of men in the family, sometimes that can mask the risk of hereditary cancer syndromes, uh, particularly those that, that involve strong components of breast, ovarian, or uterine cancers. So that's something important to, to pay attention to when assessing family history risk. But it's also important that men have this information for their own medical management, not just for reproductive purposes, because even cancer syndromes that we think of as being largely female, like BRCA, um, they do carry increased risks for men as well. Um, so BRCA can carry risks with pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. Um, and NCCN does have screening guidelines for men that are specific to these risks. Um, so another issue that um, that did come up with, with this case is that the patient initially requested all possible testing, um, but ultimately she ended up declining testing altogether once she had a better understanding of the implications. So most testing these days, Amy touched on um, that it's usually done by panels. We don't really see testing so much for one gene at a time like we used to because now we have technologies like next generation sequencing that have just made it far easier and less costly to test for several genes at the same time. Um, so when it comes to cancer genes, there are usually different panels depending on the family history. We can see uh, a lot of companies have breast panels, colon pan panels, the ovarian panels, and then there's also some general comprehensive ones that include all of them. Um, so what are the possible results of doing this type of testing? There's positive results where a pathogenic or a disease-causing variant is able to be identified. There's negative results where either nothing is found or only benign, harmless variants are found. But there's also these variants of uncertain significance that Amy mentioned, these VUS results. So that means that a variant was found in a particular gene, but the meaning of it isn't known. Um, it might be causing the gene not to function properly, in which case it would be pathogenic, but it also could just be benign human variation. And the difficulty with these results is that they're not actionable. Um, nobody should be changing their cancer screening or having risk-reducing surgeries based on a VUS because the majority of them actually do end up being reclassified as benign. 
but they are really frustrating results to get because there's just not much that can be done with them aside from really waiting and seeing if they end up getting reclassified. And the issue um, with testing for more and more genes is that you're going to get more and more VUS, particularly if someone's history isn't so strong or so suspicious of a hereditary syndrome, they're more likely to get these VUS results than they are to have a clear actionable finding. So another issue that came up in this case is that it wasn't the, the couple who was referred who ended up being tested, but it was a, a different person altogether. It was a family member because it's not always the person in front of you who is best testable. Um, so let's look at what would happen if different people in this case were tested. Um, if it were the female patient who were initially referred, she didn't have much of a family history at all. So she probably would have tested negative or had a VUS. She would have been under the impression that she had a low risk of hereditary cancer. Um, and she probably would have been falsely reassured about risks to her own future children when, in fact, there does seem to be pretty significant risk coming from her partner's side. So what if the male partner was tested? He's got a strong family history, so his results are certainly going to be more informative. Um, he could test positive, and that would probably be an informative result for his own personal risks and, and reproductive risks, although it, it might depend on the gene that he does test positive for. It's possible it still may not explain the family history. Um, if he tests negative, then, then that's a result that's not going to be informative at all because we aren't going to know if there's just no hereditary cancer risk in the family. Maybe those are all sporadic cancers. Maybe they're related to shared environmental factors. Maybe it's that familial clustering and there is no syndrome. Or maybe there is and he just didn't inherit it. Um, so he could end up being falsely reassured by a negative test when, in fact, there may actually be a hereditary cancer syndrome in the family that just hasn't been found yet, it wasn't part of that test, or it could be a hereditary cancer syndrome in the family and he truly tested negative, in which case he would be at low risk, but we wouldn't know. And then if he had a, a VUS, then there's nothing we can really do with that information. Remember, it's not actionable, um, so we really can't interpret a, a VUS in an asymptomatic individual. So what if, though, his mother ends up being tested, which is what happened in, in this case? Um, she had cancer herself, and so her results are really going to be the most informative. If she's positive, then it's pretty likely that that result's going to explain at least her own cancer. It might also, it's very likely also going to explain the rest of the family history, although, again, depending on what's found. Um, but now that a heritable cause has been found, it means that other relatives who don't have cancer would now really benefit from testing. Um, they could have more targeted testing specific to what's been found in the family. Um, and the results would be clearly informative because now if they test negative, we know there is a risk factor in the family. And, and now we know that they specifically didn't inherit it, so they can't pass it on themselves. If she's negative, then that means that we're not currently able to identify the cause of cancer in the family. It means that testing unaffected relatives like her son isn't going to be informative. Um, for those relatives, regardless of results, there, there's really no reason to test them because those relatives are going to be considered at increased risk either way, and their cancer screening really should be based on the family history, not on a negative genetic test result. If she were found to have a VUS, then yes, it's still frustrating no matter who you find a VUS in, but there may actually be additional steps that could be taken. Um, other relatives that have had cancer in the family could be tested for the VUS, and we can see if it's tracking with the cancers in the family. Does everyone who's had cancer, do they all have that same VUS? And that information can certainly add to the, the literature uh, for that particular variant, and it might end up changing the, the classification potentially. So the last thing to discuss about this case is that um, the male partner's mother, the one who, who ended up being tested, she had already had genetic testing, so why was she offered testing again? Um, Amy touched on this as well. Different labs are going to have different testing products. They're not all going to be exactly the same. Some are going to cover genes that others didn't. Um, but also she was tested back in 2015. And that might not seem like so long ago, but in, in the world of genetics, that's really eons ago. Because um, many tests are really going to change over time. There's always new genes being added to the panel as they become associated with cancer risk. Some genes are going to be removed when there's a lack of evidence to support testing for them. Um, and then as testing technologies improve, there are certain mutations we couldn't, that couldn't be detected previously. Um, like with BRCA, it used to be that we couldn't detect large rearrangements in the gene. So anyone who was tested probably 10, 15 years ago probably wasn't tested for that type of mutation. And now testing um, commonly does include the, those types. So we talked about changes in variant classification. So usually those VUSs are being downgraded to benign, but sometimes they can be upgraded to likely pathogenic. So it is often worth revisiting potentially additional testing for patients that have a really strong family history, even if they tested negative in the past.
Okay, so the second case is a couple that was referred by an IVF clinic due to the female patient's mother being diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. And both the couple and the IVF physician were interested in understanding risks and testing options for embryos. So Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder involving skeletal, ocular, and cardiovascular systems. And the mother's the mother has features that are commonly associated with Marfan syndrome. She has glaucoma, which causes blindness. She has myopia. She has a leaky heart valve, long fingers, long arms. My patient is the 33-year-old uh, that says 5'3", that had three miscarriages. Her brother reportedly had long fingers and was described as having a hump back and was born with some type of stiffness. Um, the niece, which is his daughter, uh, also had a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, had had surgery for scoliosis and club feet, and the maternal half-sister reportedly had glaucoma. Now, all of this family history came from the patient, but it is common for people, even 33-year-olds, to have limited information about family history, especially when it comes to complex diseases. So the couple is interested in uh, genetic testing for Marfan syndrome, and the gene is called FBN1, and the clinic referred for this indication. Um, it's an autosomal dominant condition. It can have overlapping features with other connective tissue disorders. It might seem tempting in your practice to say, well, you know, I does my lab offer genetic testing for this gene? And maybe I can just order it. Maybe I don't need to refer to a genetic counselor. But this case shows why that might not be the best idea. Family history in this case was somewhat limited. She didn't have a relationship with uh, her brother, the one that had the affected child. And when I was taking the family history, I requested follow-up on the diagnosis of the stiffness because this was congenital in the patient's brother at birth. And so the patient followed up with her mother and came back to me that the brother was diagnosed with a condition called congenital contractural arachnodactyly. This condition um, is a connective tissue disorder. It's caused by a different gene, FBN2, not FBN1. Um, it causes contractures, which are permanently bent joints. It causes kyphoscoliosis, which is the hump back. It causes camptodactyly, which is permanently bent fingers or toes, and a pectus, which is an overgrowth of the ribs. So in my mind, the patient's mother and the niece were diagnosed with Marfan, but there's no documentation available. And to me, it was unlikely that there were two different conditions in the family that were closely related. So I recommended genetic counseling and testing for the patient's mother. So in taking the family history uh, from the female patient's mother, she was able to provide more information. So she now has the arrow and she is the dark colored in circle, she's 65. She again has glaucoma, long fingers, long arms. She also has rheumatoid arthritis, which is probably unrelated. Her last echocardiogram was 27 years ago. She has mitral valve prolapse, elbow contractures, which was a new piece of information, and she had bilateral knee dislocations, which was originally how she was diagnosed with um, Marfan syndrome. She has a brother that had dislocated knees. She has a sister that had kyphoscoliosis. She had another brother who died of a heart attack at age 55 with contractures and long fingers. Her father had glaucoma, pectus, kyphoscoliosis, strabismus, high myopia, and elbow contractures. And then her son, which was diagnosed with CCA at birth, um, his daughter had no new additional uh, features, but his son had retinal detachments at age 12, and the maternal half-sister had um, a possible club foot. So when I look at the pattern in this family, it really doesn't look like they have Marfan syndrome. It looks like they probably all have CCA. And why is that? Um, it can happen because it seems that the person who made the diagnosis in my patient's mother was not a clinical geneticist. She didn't know who the physician was, but um, the diagnosis came 
in light of the dislocations and whoever the physician was made this diagnosis in a room full of physicians, but um, didn't really provide any follow-up, didn't really provide her any guidance in terms of uh, cardiology follow-up since she hasn't had an echocardiogram in 27 years and patients with Marfan syndrome are at risk for aortic rupture. So it's, it's hard to know why the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome stuck, um, but it's possible that it's because no one really looked at the full family history and took into account her son's diagnosis of CCA. So I offered genetic testing to the patient's mother for FBN1 and FBN2 um, because there was this diagnosis of Marfan syndrome and we can test for both genes. I didn't offer the full connective tissue panel, which has 24 genes because of the risk of the US, which we've talked about. Um, you can, we can test for the first two genes. If they come back positive, we have an answer. If they come back negative, we can reflex to the other 22 genes and see if there is a different diagnosis. We talked about the echocardiogram, the genetic testing will not only hopefully be able to answer a question about what her actual diagnosis is, but will allow her to get the proper follow-up based on what the features of that particular disorder uh, would be most importantly for her cardiology. Um, if a positive test result is received, then I can order, order testing for my female original patient. Um, and if she is positive, the couple can choose to have PGTM. My patient has no features. Um, and so possibly she would test negative. Um, the case is still ongoing and the results are pending. But, you know, the most important take home message from this case is because of the confusion or what seemed to be the diagnosis of Marfan in the patient's mother, if genetic testing for FBN1 had been performed by the IVF clinic on my female patient, the correct diagnosis probably would have been missed. It would have been the wrong gene. I'm not sure of this yet because we don't have the test results, but that's what I'm thinking. The history of the stiffness was the tip off. And that was, um, I mean, maybe non-genetic counselors would identify that as a red flag, but that was the tip off to me. I'm familiar with different genetic conditions and something congenital described as stiffness uh, was a big red flag. And these are the kinds of important nuances that can be missed by other practitioners that are not well-versed in genetics. So just to, to backtrack on this, um, we discussed that Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder. It's caused by pathogenic variants in the FBN1 gene um, and inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. So anyone who has Marfan syndrome has a 50% chance of passing it on in each pregnancy. Um, and it's definitely very important to know if someone has Marfan syndrome because they do need to be managed by a multidisciplinary healthcare team. They need regular surveillance um, to monitor for aortic rupture. And they also need to avoid certain activities like contact sports and isometric exercise that could increase that risk. Uh, but as, as Amy mentioned, the, the issue here is that there are a lot of genetic disorders that can have overlapping symptoms. So someone who may seem like they have Marfan syndrome can actually have one of many different connective tissue disorders. Um, so the differential for Marfan includes uh, CCA, the condition that did come up in this patient, um, and it's caused by a completely different gene. might sound like it's similar because it's called FBN2, but it is a totally different gene. Um, there's also lloyd beat syndrome, which can involve several different genes. There's a few different types of Ehlers-Danlos that can overlap with Marfan, um, homocystinuria, Stickler syndrome, and heritable thoracic aortic disease. So all of these can look like Marfan syndrome, but they can have completely, but they do all have completely different um, underlying genetic etiologies. Um, another factor that does play into this complicated um, diagnosis is variable expressivity, meaning that not everybody with the same condition is going to always have the exact same features. Um, different people can have different symptom severity. So that can certainly complicate things when trying to make an accurate diagnosis. So why is it so important to distinguish between all these conditions if they're really so similar? Um, well, if the patient in our case was tested for Marfan syndrome, just based on her reported family history, she would have been tested for the FBN1 gene and she would have tested negative. So then she would have been under the impression that one, she doesn't need any kind of medical management, um, and two, that she can't pass on that condition to her children if she tested negative, when in fact she may still have an FBN2 mutation, 
um, but she wouldn't be getting the medical management that she needs, and she would still have a 50-50 chance of having an affected child, but wouldn't have been able to be offered PGTS. So it's definitely very necessary to know exactly what condition we're dealing with um, to make sure that the patient is being counseled appropriately about the risk for themselves, for family members, and also to have all available options for managing reproductive risk. So the last thing we wanted to touch on about this case, um, and this is kind of bringing it back to, to sort of where we started, is there is a very common misconception that all genetic testing is the same. Um, I hear a very common phrase often from patients who say, I was genetically tested as if there's this one size fits all genetic test that just covers everything that it needs to. Um, and this comes up particularly in the IVF clinic because most patients are being offered expanded carrier screening. Um, and that's looking at somewhere between usually 100 to 300 genes, which might sound like a lot, but when we think about, we've got about 20,000 known genes. Um, so ultimately it really is just a drop in the bucket. Um, also carrier screening is usually focusing on autosomal recessive conditions where both partners need to be carriers. Um, some panels are including a few X-linked conditions, but generally none of them are including autosomal dominant conditions like the connective tissue disorders or the hereditary cancer syndromes that we've been discussing. Um, also carrier screening differs from diagnostic testing, not just in what it covers, but also on the technical level. Um, carrier screening labs usually do not report variants of uncertain significance when a carrier screening test is being done. Um, because you can imagine for an unaffected individual being tested for 300 diseases, you're probably going to find quite a few VUSs and that information is just not actionable in a reproductive setting. What are you going to do with that? Versus if someone is affected with a genetic condition and they're pursuing diagnostic testing, then there could be additional steps to be taken um, through testing other relatives, seeing if it's tracking in the family and potentially hoping for a reclassification. Um, so even if there is a particular condition that is uh, in the family history and, it's, and it happens to be on the expanded carrier screening panel, there still may be different or additional testing that's more appropriate for the patient. So overall, um, genetic testing really, it, it can be a useful tool, but it's best used in conjunction with detailed family history information. It just can't replace family history altogether. So there's nothing special about these particular patients or these particular cases. They exist in every practice. Unfortunately, many patients have significant family histories that are unrecognized by their primary care physician, either because they hadn't asked detailed enough questions or they never updated the patient's family history. There are all kinds of risk factors lurking in family histories, and I believe that the best practice is really to start with the family history evaluation for all preconception and IVF patients as a routine screening tool. I can give you an example. I've had over the last 20 years three different patients when I've done a pre-IVF uh, family history analysis and identified cancer risk made recommendations for surveillance prior to starting their IVF like a colonoscopy or a mammogram, and I've had three patients that actually have been identified to have cancer that needed treatment in order to then start their IVF cycle later. So you could save a life. Um, it's just so important. Um, and there are plenty of genetic counselors to help fill this need. I've heard before, oh, genetic counselors are hard to find. They're busy. We're not. Um, we have time. We can, you know, you can contact one of us, you can contact the genetic counseling professional group uh, through ASRM, you can look on NSGC's website um, for find a genetic counselor. There are lots of genetic counselors in um, private practice or who do contract work that um, you can access to fill this need in your practice should you desire that. So I recently coincidentally published uh, an article in the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics, um, and it has four additional cases uh, that are similar to this um, if you're interested in reading more about that. So I'm going to pass it over to Lauren now, who will start the Q&A session. All right. I think the first question I'm going to have Amy answer. Um, this is regarding case one, which is the cancer genetics case. So Amy, in case one, even if the risk was low, why not test the female partner's family? So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? 
I, the female partner, I did offer her testing because not because I thought it was indicated, but because she she came to me asking for testing. And the way I look at it, patients are able to access this type of testing through a primary care doctor or even sometimes on their own. And so even though uh, I didn't necessarily think that it was indicated, I did offer her the testing. And after the genetic counseling session and her understanding of the risk being low, and talking about the potential for the US is she made her own decision to decline testing. So I did offer it. Thank you for that. Um, building off of that question, um, this could be for Amy or Andrea. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on why someone would maybe decide not to undergo cancer genetic testing even if they technically met those NCCN cancer testing guidelines? Sure. Um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of people who um, feel nervous about the possibility of getting a positive genetic test result. Um, I have had patients who have had significant family history or personal history of cancer that have ordered a test and gone so far as to want to cancel the test after it was in process just because they were anxious about getting the test results. So sometimes patients would prefer to just be monitored as though they were positive rather than get an actual test result that was positive. There is something for some people that uh, is very anxiety provoking about genetic testing. Okay, um, I'll give this next one to Andrea. So Andrea, given the availability of genetic panels and the shortage of genetic counselors, how do you think doctors should practically integrate genetics into their clinical practice? Yeah, I think, and I think that Amy touched on this um, during her introduction, um, that there, and during the summary as well, that there are genetic counselors certainly available. Um, there are genetic counselors that can be located through the NSGC website, um, and lab genetic counselors are not always addressing these things. So, so lab genetic counselors are are fantastic for dealing with what's being tested for. Um, but aren't always looking for things outside of there. So it is really important that um, that there is some way found to incorporate this type of information. And whether it's through questionnaires to sort of start through things and then refer, um, there are now, we know that some companies are starting to offer genetic counseling chatbots to try to, to um, refer people directly to genetic counselors that would meet certain criteria. Um, so it is definitely really important to, to find a way to incorporate um, genetic counselors into the practice. Amy, did you want to add anything to that? No, that was good. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question, um, is there a list of red flags you can provide to the audience so we can give patients before their initial visit? So I suppose I suppose these red flags could either be um, specifically related to hereditary cancer syndromes, which we did touch on. Um, but as we know, as genetic counselors, uh, there are many different types of red flags in family histories. Um, so I know we talked about some of the cancer red flags, but are there any other ones that either of you want to um, speak about that often come up in family histories that may not be apparent to um, you know, a non-genetics provider? I think it's a great question. I think it's a very, it's a common question. I don't think that there is an easy answer. Um, red flags, we, we talked about red flags for cancer, multiple affected generations, early age of onset, bilaterality for breast cancer, um, multiple types of related cancers. But I think, um, you know, in the general, family history taking preconceptionally, things like mental retardation, physical birth defects, multiple miscarriage, you know, anything that sounds unusual. Sometimes that's a very, that sounds like a very general um, 
thing, but like the stiffness, something congenital. Um, you know, these kinds of things are worth asking more questions about. Um, but there's not really a good list. Um, repeated types of um, conditions in the family, early heart attack or stroke. Um, it's very hard to, to, to give a list. I think also just to add to that one difficult thing is that some of these conditions that we think about as genetic counselors we is a red flag for us is not always so obvious to patients. Like one thing that we commonly see missed, and this is addressed in um, Amy's paper, is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Um, I would say I have sort of experienced this as well, where you ask a patient about any history of genetic conditions in the family or, or anything that runs in the family, and that seems to be something that is frequently missed unless you specifically ask about it. Um, I think probably because it's later onset, um, and, and if it's affecting multiple family members, they're just usually not really thinking about it because it's sort of the norm in the family. So there are some things like that that just require some additional probing. There's also this notion that the process of genetic counseling and the going back and forth and talking about different conditions um, helps patients remember things, things that tend to be important. I mean, if I had to take a guess, you know, the things that are told to me in a genetic counseling session, you know, toward the end, you know, oh, I almost forgot to mention this. It's they tend to be extremely significant. So there's something about just the process of talking about family history um, that can, you know, provide this information. Great, thank you. So this next one is a really good question. It's a loaded question, so I'd like I'd like both of you to to weigh in on this since you're um, coming from similar uh, but different patient experiences. So the question is: In my experience, patients with infertility often see genetic concerns either in their family history or on carrier screening as yet another barrier to conception. And they will feel that this will cause more delays, especially if we recommend testing in other family members. And so sometimes they'd rather just not follow up on, on genetic concerns that are identified. Do you have any counseling strategies um, for fellow genetic counselors to help with patients that are experiencing these types of emotions? Um, I mean, I think it is somewhat coincidental that both of the cases involved testing an outside family member. It actually is not that common in my practice. It was just a coincidence. But I think that, um, you know, patients decide to follow up in different ways. And I think that um, the biggest hurdle is getting the patient to attend the genetic counseling session because I think a lot of it's a lot of either patients or clinics view another step which would be meeting with a genetic counselor as a potential barrier something that costs money something that takes time something that takes time to schedule but if the patient you know ends up talking to me you know really it's nothing is mandatory. Um, after talking about the risks, after talking about the benefits of testing, um, patients will make their own decisions. And that's not to say that if the outside family member, you know, was a barrier to testing, that we couldn't have offered something to, you know, the patient that was referred. Um, it doesn't always have to be a confusing or complication, complicated or time-laden situation. I think it just depends, and it depends on how far the patient wants to go in order to get the most accurate result possible. Yeah, I think that there's no easy answer there, especially because the process of genetic testing, if the patient does want to go down that path, can be lengthy. Um, and especially if it's going to lead to something like PGTM, then having a, a custom test created for that, it, the whole process can definitely take quite a bit of time. Um, I think the important thing is just making sure that patients are aware of what their options are. Um, you know, the, the way that, that I like to present it to patients is, you know, if you're going to go down this type of path, here's what the timeline is going to look like. But it's, it really is an if. 
Um, and there are a lot of patients that may sort of enter that process um, thinking, you know, this is something that is going back to autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, um, since that is something that comes up pretty often. Uh, a lot of patients do start with, okay, I've got this condition, it's in my family, I want to go down the path of doing TGTM for it. And then when we go through, okay, here's what it's going to take to try to identify your mutation. Here's the chances that we may not identify your mutation. If we find it, then here's the next step of testing family members. Here's what happens if we find a VUS. Then we're finally getting on to the TGTM part. And when they start to realize what a, a process that is, some patients do change their mind and they say, you know what, that's not really the road I want to go down. I thought I did. I thought it would be simpler. Um, but some patients, if it's really important to them, they do feel, you know what, this might actually be worth delaying treatment. So nobody wants it to be a barrier. Um, but we just want to make sure that the patient has the option to, to make that decision. Great. Okay, so I'm going to combine a, combine a couple of questions uh, on this next one. And this is still regarding case one, which was the cancer genetic case. Um, so specifically about the female partner who declined testing, you know, partially because of the risk of finding a variant of uncertain significance. Um, so part one of the question, uh, wouldn't it provide more information regarding that decision if the family member with the breast cancer history had been tested? And then subsequent to that, if you can touch on some of the advice for um, patients who undergo this type of testing and may have a VUS, what would be your recommendations for um, future follow-up and getting more information on that VUS in the future for their children as we start to learn more about these genetic variants? Um, yes, it would potentially provide uh, more information if the affected person was tested in case one, the affected aunt, the 63-year-old, but this case was a while ago, and I don't remember the exact specifics, but she was unable to be tested. And so it is always best to test an affected family member. Um, you know, there wasn't necessarily like a clinical indication to test her because she was a 63-year-old woman with unilateral breast cancer and no family history. But if, if, if the family had wanted testing, yes, that would have been... Um, the way to go, but she was unavailable. Um, and then in terms of the VUS, um, knowing whether VUS is uh, reclassified is an automatic process that comes from the laboratory. So the lab will um, contact the ordering provider with information about whether it's been upgraded or downgraded. And so, there's really nothing to do until um, which point you would notify the patient if you got some information back from the laboratory that said that the either that the VUS had been classified as benign, which means they can forget about it, um, or in a rare case that it was upgraded to something that was pathogenic or likely pathogenic that would then come into play and possibly influence her, his or her surveillance. Andrea, I don't know if you want to make a further comment on that. Yeah, just that sometimes it can be worth contacting other labs, too, to see how they're classifying that VUS, um, particularly if the patient was tested at a, a newer lab that hasn't been around as long, um, contacting labs that have been doing that testing, testing for that particular gene for a longer time. They might have some data out there or, or that they've kept um, inside that hasn't been released. Um, and also sometimes even just contacting that, that first lab, um, usually, yes, they're going to reach out if they've reclassified it, but sometimes it can sort of initiate a, a little bit of an earlier process. Um, so usually I recommend, um, I don't deal a lot with hereditary cancer cases, but for diagnostic cases, particularly for um, inherited uh, cardiomyopathies or arrhythmias where the, the information that we're gaining is just coming so quickly, I usually recommend that patients check in at least once a year to see if, if that has changed. Right. All right. So this next one, um, you know, this is something that comes up often, and this is um, 
kind of related to family history risk assessment in, in gamete donors. Um, so the question really is about, you know, if, if a gamete donor either um, reports a completely negative family history or has very significant gaps in the knowledge of their family medical history, how do you handle that and are there any genetic tests that you can potentially offer that gamete donor um, that would provide any clarity on those answers? Um, well, I work a lot with gamete donors and I have for 20 years. Um, you know, the way that I try to preemptively handle that is by um, prepping them with a lot of questions to ask their family members, um, not, not questions, but um, types of information that I want them to gather. And I do expect them to go back to family and um, ask general and specific questions. I send them a long email um, so that our conversation is as productive as possible. And then when I'm asking questions, I do the same uh, type of intuitive look at the family history. If there are red flags, I ask for follow-up. Um, I probably send maybe 20% of donors back to get additional information. Um, it's more common that gamete donors uh, versus someone in the intended parent category um, would have missing or kind of what sounds like erroneous or mixed up information about their family history. Um, so I have this process that I've kind of developed to try to get as as rigorous of a family history as I possibly can. So very few gamete donors that I do an evaluation on have like nothing in the family history. Um, so the process seems to work pretty well. In terms of testing, um, you know, th there's not really, I mean, genetic carrier screening, don't forget, is mostly testing for recessive conditions. And so those conditions don't show up in the family uh, history. So like sort of ordering a panel of carrier screening on a donor um, isn't really going to provide information about the family history. And there's not really any short list of um, genetic tests that either can or should be ordered for or offered to a gamete donor, because if you're talking about screening for autosomal dominant, you know, things like cancer and things like that, if you got a positive hit, you would be making a pre-symptomatic diagnosis and that's not why the gamete donor was referred, that's not why she came to you. Um, and it's actually outside of the ASRM guidelines. Did I answer the whole question? Yes. Okay. That's great. Um, so we're gonna just take one more question. Um, and this is a really important one, so I'd like both of you to weigh in on this question. Um, the question is, I work directly with reproductive endocrinologists, many of whom do not utilize genetic counseling services for their patients, though they need them. It seems that um, many providers do not know the difference between laboratory and clinical genetic counselors and their roles. I would love to increase IVF docs awareness of the need for family history review and a non-lab genetic counselor that patients can access. Have you had any luck, quote unquote, selling your genetic counseling services um, to clinics and providers? And if so, how have you done this? Do you want me to answer, Andrea, or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm in private practice, so yes, I have had experience um, with this, and um, I understand the uh, frustration that you are feeling um, because I have felt it too. I think that um, what I have done over the last 20 years is to try to be the ge best genetic counselor that I can be. And in the reports that I provide to um, agencies or IVF clinics uh, to try to let them speak for themselves and to outline exactly it, the, the reports themselves are the marketing material because just marketing to IVF clinics, I haven't found to be overly helpful other than just getting a name out there that 
in the future, if there was a need um, for a genetic counselor, they may remember that you had sent them something. Um, so, I mean, you know, doing webinars like this, writing journal articles, um, giving talks, these are also ways of trying to, um, you know, highlight the importance of genetic counselors and letting IVF clinics know that while genetic counseling might be a small specialty, we're here and we're available to assist you in multiple different ways. Um, I don't know, it's a difficult, it, it is difficult, um, but I think that we just have to keep chipping away and, um, you know, making our presence known and uh, elaborate on how we can help and what we can do. Um, so I hope that helps. And Andrea, since you're directly um, integrated into an IVF practice, maybe you could spend a minute talking about all of those different roles and what you do in your clinical practice as a genetic counselor. Yeah, it's definitely a different um, type of role. So there's there's a lot more coordination. Um, I, I definitely use lab counselors quite a bit because some of those more routine things like for carrier screening, um, you can't have one genetic counselor in a practice where everybody's getting potentially expanded carrier screening. Um, everybody's going to be a carrier of something when you're using these large panels. And so using those lab genetic counselors for sort of the more routine things, trying to kind of coordinate and streamline um, for more high risk or things that are not usually part of the, the lab counselor role like family history. Um, but I do think that, that there are a lot of misconceptions um, and we see that because there are very few IVF clinics that actually do have in-house genetic counselors or that use um, uh, private practices that, that refer to private practices and there are, are a number out there. Um, but, but a lot of clinics are just not utilizing these services. So I think there are some misconceptions um, really about the, the fact that lab counselors can replace in-house genetic counselors or referrals to private practice, um, and also the misconception that genetic counselors are going to be these barriers telling the patients, you know, hold on, don't do your cycle, let's wait, let's do all sorts of testing, when, when really that's not what we're here for. Okay, that concludes the Q&A session. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you um, to our panelists and attendees. You will receive a survey by email after this session. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant content and your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please watch your email for notification about future webinars. And for any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at asrm.org. This concludes the webinar.